for I would walk alone in storm and tempest, or in starlight night beneath the quiet heavens, and at that time have felt whatever there is of power in sound to breathe an elevated mood by form or image unprofaned. And I would stand beneath some rock, listening to sounds that are the ghostly language of the ancient earth, or make their dim abode in distant winds. Thence did I drink the visionary power. I deem not profitless those fleeting moods of shadowy exultation, not for this that they are kindred to our purer mind and intellectual life, but that the soul, remembering how she felt, but what she felt remembering not, retains an obscure sense of possible sublimity, to which, with growing faculties, she does aspire. Welcome to Sunday Morning Poetry. This is the Troubadour Podcast, and I just read from you a passage from probably the greatest work of romantic literature in poetry, The Prelude by William Wordsworth. Now, that's not our poem today. Our poem is actually lines written in early spring by William Wordsworth in the 1798 Lyrical Ballads. But what I want to get across today is something that I hope, for those of you who are following along in all of this journey of the lyrical ballads, or at least chunks of it, some of it, more than just one-off poems, is the totality that a work of a great artist can really have on you in reading, because what it allows you to do is get a scope of the, the idea that they really hone in on in their entirety of their life. When Wordsworth wrote this prelude that I read to you, it was 1805, about seven years after he wrote lines written, uh, some written in early spring. And he was, in a sense, talking about a fundamental shift in the way that he approached poetry, literature, life. Now, let me tell you a little bit about his background literarily. One of the most impactful people for Wordsworth was a man named Robert Burns, the Scottish bard. To this day, he's considered the Scottish bard. Now, he was, uh, Wordsworth was given a book and he was able to study Burns and Cooper and several other of the great, not just read them a little bit, but really intensely study these individuals. And he loved Burns. Burns was probably one of his favorites. And in fact, Robert Burns is considered a pre-romantic. He was leading up to what the romantics did. Now, there are differences, of course. There are some differences. There's a focus shift. And this shift, I think, that the prelude is uh, indicating here is somewhat what is different between Burns and Wordsworth and the romantics. Coleridge equally loved Burns. Now, I'm going to read you two poems today, lines written in early spring as our focus, but I'm going to also read a slightly longer poem. The the lines poem is very short. It's, uh, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six stanzas, six short stanzas. So it's a very quick little read, but we are going to do an analysis and a discussion of it. I think it's an incredibly important and powerful poem, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And it's, again, one of his deceptively simple poems. It's one that you could easily look at and not think much about, not think that there's a lot going on when there really is. And uh, and then I'm going to read a poem by Robert Burns, Man Was Made to Mourn. And we're going to talk about what he means by made to mourn. And there's a reference, one of the reasons I chose this secondary poem is that Wordsworth has a reference to this poem in the the lines poem that we'll be reading. So uh, there's there's a little little poem that he read, excuse me, that uh, Wordsworth wrote when he found out that Burns was dead. So Burns preceded, uh, Burns died quite young. He was 37 years old. He died in 1796, I believe. So he never really got to encounter and and, uh, deal with Wordsworth, although Wordsworth did meet uh, his wife, uh, Burns' wife. 
but they didn't really interact or they didn't interact at all except through the poem from the poems through of uh, Burns. So he was, of course, very sad. This was a big moment for him because, again, not only it's it's a big moment for anybody that Burns died, of course, but it was really big for Wordsworth and, of course, the loss of someone because it was so young, 37. And when you have someone like that who's a genius, I mean, who knows what could have happened, right? It's always That's always part of the romantic appeal, actually, is same thing with Keats. What could have happened if Keats would have lived another 25 years even to live to 50 years old? I mean, he was just getting started. He died at 25. I mean, look at what Wordsworth uh, accomplished. Wordsworth would have been nothing had he died at 25. He didn't write lyrical ballads, his first great work of art, until he was almost 30. So, you know, it's like it's a, it's always a question of like what would have happened uh, if these guys could have survived. And there's something about the romantic spirit that they they kind of fizzled out too early. You know, they burned both candles, the candles on the candle on both ends kind of idea and then they kind of fade away this is what we feel when we hear romantic and why it's not practical when burns died wordsworth wrote this little poem i mourned with thousands but as one more deeply grieved for he was gone whose light i hailed when first it shone and i showed in my youth how verse may build a princely throne on humble truth and I think this really speaks to a lot of what he's trying to do in his youth. That this is kind of the mission statement is to build a princely throne on humble truth. And you'll see a lot of this going on uh, in his poetry. Now, reading Burns and others helped to foster William's appreciation of the beauties of nature. And uh, he veered at, at this around this time into a more contemplative path. This is a path that you don't really see as much in the pre-romantics. And, and this, I think, is important. It's not to say that they didn't think, but the focus is so heavily on what contemplation is and the imagination and how the imagination works and the inner mind of the soul. So, for instance, the theme of the prelude, which is an epic poem, the theme of the prelude is the growth of the poet's mind. That's the theme. It's, it's an autobiography, in a sense, of William Wordsworth, which a lot of people have accused him of being one of the most egotistical men in the history of the world for writing an epic poem about his own imagination and his own inner workings and, and you know, his own biography and how he developed as a man. So instead of Milton uh, or Dante, you know, being guided by, uh, by, by Virgil and, and uh, you know, going through the, the layers of hell and purgatory and heaven, you know, instead of that, it's some other characters, and it's going through the mind of uh, William Wordsworth. I mean, think about that for a second. Forget Christianity. Go into my minds, fools. Like, that's kind of what it feels like to a lot of people at this era, which I, of course, love. I think that's amazing. And I think it's why he's so great. It's one of the reasons why he's so great. Now, he takes this veer into this contemplative mode, which is a different, it's a shift in the way that poetry, I think, and, and literature Focus on, focuses on it. And then there is a shift in literature. This is what the, the 19th century really brought the shift into contemplation of the mind more. You get more inner monologues. Like it's the narrative of the, the inside of the consciousness is more developed. As Victor Hugo put it, there's one thing grander than the sea, that is the sky. There's one thing grander than the sky, that is the interior of the soul. And that's what the romantics were really focused on. And they're focused on it, not in and of itself, but in relation to nature. And this is one of the big projects of the Romantics, is the relationship between soul and nature. And that's what we're going to get in lines written in early spring, as well as some other poems um, that this is a prelude to itself, which we'll talk about in a second. So from his shift, when he gets this shift into contemplation, from here he sought solitude in order to become one with the landscape and to experience what he would later call the instincts of immortality. I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Now, the Burns poem we're going to talk about at the end has something to do, we're going to see something here, and we're going to look at what is the difference between nature and the making of mankind. What makes 
a man? How do you make, like build a man, you know, the million dollar man, build him in a, in a shop, make a cake, bake a cake. Like, how do you make something like that? How does that work? And then one of the things we, we learn in reading a whole book of poetry, and I've said this many times, but I think it's important that we've lost this art of reading and having a whole experience of a book of poetry. I mean, when these were written, and for a hundred years, this was the common thing, and, and even before this, it's you would, you know, take a book of poetry and you would take it with you everywhere. I mean, that was the thing you, not only you read, but you reread. You read, you know, in the places that they were actually written. So if you have you know, lines written, left on a, upon a yew tree, you would go to that tree or you'd go to a yew tree and try to experience a little bit. I mean, there's, there's something of that that was much more common and prevalent at this time. And I think we've lost something in, in not experiencing that. You know, it's the, the closest we come to, I think, is people with their you know, drone videos of, of uh, Greece or something. And then you want to go to Greece and you go to Greece and you, you know, that's it. And you see the things that you saw on camera and that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's something much more deeper that we can get. I think if we have the right ability to understand how our soul or how this author's soul, this writer's soul interacts and experiences the world, and that can help us in experiencing the world. It can help us in finding out the connections that we enjoy. It can help us build those connections and how we make connections about what we love and why we love those things. And we're going to talk about, and again, the process to make that happen, to know thyself is a contemplative process. You have to know how to think, how to contemplate, what to contemplate. And that is, you know, that's, that's kind of the theme. It's, it's not the, the focus. He's not teaching you how to contemplate. He's writing poetry, showing you what it looks like. Now, in this poem, we're going to go into the, the poem by Wordsworth now, lines written in early spring. A couple things. One, this is um, the, the ending of the 1798 lyrical ballads, the last poem, is lines written above Tinturnham Abbey. And it has a long um, title that I don't remember the whole thing. It's like, on my second visit from the Y in 1798 or something like that. It's like, it's like this long thing. It is an amazing poem. It's one of his greatest, but by far, everybody would agree with that. You know, there's I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. There's uh, Tinturn Abbey. There's intimations of immortality. I mean, even think about the word there, intimations of immortality like it's an in, it's it's a, a hint of it and and there's something you know he's obsessed with that border of the, the the reality of this thing and and the process that you go to get there and, and he a lot of his poems have this kind of border feeling and in fact he's often called in nickname the border poet he because he writes on that border of consciousness between the reality of the world that we're in and the consciousness in our mind and the interaction between those two, that's what Wordsworth is really obsessed with. Although he doesn't quite have the language necessary. And there's a long story about him and Coleridge, and Coleridge was more of the philosopher, the deeper philosopher, and he was supposed to, for instance, give certain works to help um, William, but he never could finish it. He could never do it. And <laughs> you know, anybody who's ever studied uh, German philosophy might appreciate this, that Coleridge... Uh, supposedly went somewhat insane. And part of it was, or you know, it's a little bit of exaggeration, but he went somewhat mad in his attempt to understand. And, uh, uh, you know, again, this is a bit of a stretch, but, you know, you can learn a, or you can, um, some people have said something along the lines of it's the German philosophy that he studied that he tried to untangle, never could even come close, and it drove him a little bit mad. And if you've ever read any of that stuff, you can kind of see why especially someone who's so obsessed with um, reality because these guys were obsessed with nature and, and looking out at the world and then what your mind does. Okay, so let's go into the poem. I'm going to read it once and then we're going to go through it stanza by stanza. I think this is a really powerful poem, but it's, um, it, again, it's going to sound really simple. You'll, you'll, the words you're going to know, I don't know if there's any words you may not know, um, if there are, then we'll go through it. But I think they're all, you know, pretty simple. I mean, primrose is a, a type of a very popular plant in, uh, you know, in Europe. So it's very, just a very common plant in Europe. It has a yellow hue. 
Periwinkle is another type of flower. Uh, so I think, you know, again, I think it's pretty simple. Okay. Lines written in early spring by William Wordsworth. I heard a thousand blended notes while in a grove I sat reclined in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. To her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran, and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man. Through primrose tufts in that green bower the periwinkle trailed its wreaths, and tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. The birds around me hopped and played, their thoughts I cannot measure. But the least motion which they made, it seemed a thrill of pleasure. The budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air. And I must think, do all I can, that there was pleasure there. If this belief from heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament? What man has made of man? By the way, I um I will put the correct one. This is the eighteen oh five version that you just read. I or that I just read. I want to read the last stanza of the seventeen ninety eight. So there was a huge shift. There was a shift in him that you can see when you read both versions of these thing of these poems. The last stanza is if. I these thoughts may not prevent. So, and then in the last stanza of the 1805, it says, if this belief from heaven be sent, and then the 1798, if such be of my creed, the plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? And he says, um, you know, in the, in the 1805 version, 1802 version, excuse me, is if this belief from heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? So there's a difference because it's a big difference to say my creed, which is, you know, my set of beliefs. You know, he's saying it's mine versus this set of belief is sent by heaven. So he he did kind of whiffle on his beliefs, I think, a little bit. To some degree, it was sent by heaven. That means one thing. Another degree is another way that he, you know, believes it, I think, deeply is that he's cr the creator of this great creed. And he does believe that even after the 1802, but there is a shift here and he makes this shift and he struggles with this, I think, for a lot of his life. You know, is it heaven sent? Is there something holy or, or omniscient or omnipotent? You know, some power that's more powerful than I am, or is it really me? Do I really have that power, uh, you know, to come up with this kind of whole philosophy, this whole religion? And that's how he, he believed of it. Okay, so let's go into the stanza by stanza reading of this. So I heard a thousand blended notes and I just want to stop there. I hope that the, you know, I may not be reading it beautifully. My, I don't know if my voice is beautiful enough, but, or at all, but I heard a thousand blended notes. I heard a thousand blended notes. I heard a thousand blended notes. So, I mean, say that to yourself. There's a, there's a ring to that thousand blended notes. There's something special about that phrase, I think. And think about what it it brings to mind when it says, while in a grove I sat reclined. So he's sitting in this grove and he's hearing a thousand blended notes. In that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. Now, that I think is an interesting thing to think about that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. I think one of the keys to understanding much of Wordsworth's paradoxes like this is actually a quote from a Matthew poem, one of his poems, the Matthew poems, where he says, the wiser, I'm paraphrasing, the wiser mind mourns less for what age takes away than what it leaves behind. And the way I've interpreted that in reading a lot of Wordsworth is age or life, you know, 
being a, the longer you are alive, the more things are taken from you. Loved ones, hobbies, energy. But what is left behind is what you should, uh, you should mourn less of that. Don't mourn that too much. Mourn what's left behind, which is things like the, the, the experience of the joys that you felt with that person. Right? What you were able to do physically in your youth, that's what's left behind, is that the wisps of those memories that are still there. And so you feel, you know, if you think about losing, even a, in a breakup, it's not even a death or anything, something more modern that we can relate to. If you were with a person for any amount of time, then there were good times. And if you reflect on those good times, in that sweet mood, when pleasant thoughts, those are the pleasant thoughts, going to a party, enjoying a night alone, going to a museum, having a long conversation, all these, whatever it was for you going on a trip together, whatever it was, you know, all the things, maybe there's a really powerful memory and your mind goes to that pleasant thought. And then the, the, it brings sad thoughts to the mind. Why? Because you're not with that person anymore. Right. So there's, or that person's gone for whatever reason. So there, there is a kind of plus. So I think, I hope you can see the relationship between those two. Now, this stands that essentially William is sitting in a grove listening to the sounds of nature. That's important. And we're going to return to that. The sounds of nature. He's just listening. There's chirping, thousand blended notes, just leaves rustling, birds chirping, critters crawling. And this, this, the nature causes him to reflect. Okay, that's important. Reflect on pleasant thoughts. What kind of pleasant thoughts? The kind that brings sad thoughts to mind. For him, at least. Stanza two. To her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran, and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man. So now William is intimately connected to nature. He's linked. And her fair works means, I think, something along the lines of the workings of nature as projected in a thousand blood notes. That's her, to her fair works, did nature, capital N, like a, de a reified, a deified nature, link the human soul that ran, that through me ran. So there's, there's a line running through him and nature. This is that border. He's on the border. It's him and nature. It's him and reality. He speaks of nature's link, and, and this means that the sound he is hearing is causing a mood of contemplation. That's the link. It links his soul with nature. Links equals connects. Connects his soul with nature. Then his contemplation, or the result of his contemplation, causes him to grieve. And much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man, what man has made of man. So when we're talking about it, he's in that mood of sweet, the sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. So you've maybe been in that state before you've gone on a walk and you just, your mind goes to pleasant places that bring sadness to your mind. It's, it's not a simple, you know, when we talk about emotions today, it's like happy, sad, joyful, mad, that's it. But there's a lot of complexity and shadings to emotions that I think great poets help you see. So there's there's the emotion of being in a sweet mood. So it is there is a pleasance. Have you ever wanted to listen to sad music? Right? Why do you want even when you're somewhat happy and you some for some reason you get in a mood that you want to listen to sad music and you don't want to cry, you don't want to be sad, but you you enjoy the sad music in that moment. And that's the sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. Now he's in this mood and he sees and he hears, and of course he's seeing it, but he's focused on the, the hearing, the fair works, like the, the, the clay models, the, the, the development of the seed into a tree. Nature created this and it also created him. And, and there's a link between him and nature that you know ran through him. And in that sweet mood with those contemplations, 
He grieved. What did he grieve about? What man has made of man. So that's going to be a key thing here. What, did, what does it mean for man to make man? What did, you know, what has man made of man? What has he, what has he done there? So let's go through. So he's kind of set up what the whole situation is. Now we're going to go through um, some of his contemplations. Through primrose tops in that green bower, the periwinkle trailed its wreaths, and tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. I think that might be slightly different in the, in the 1798. So let me check for you. Through primrose tops in that sweet bower, the periwinkle trailed its wreaths. Oh, it's the same thing. Nope, it's different. Yeah, so he, but the least motion which they made, it seemed a thrill of pleasure. Oh, uh, probably because I read the wrong, <laughs> the wrong uh, uh, stanza. We, I read the next stanza. Let me try that again. And tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. No, it's the same thing. My apologies. Okay. Well, you got to hear it again a couple more times. So through primrose tufts, so, you know, a tuft is like the, when the, uh, a whole bunch of plants are connected at the base, right? And there's like a tuft of them, like a connection, a, a bunch. So he's kind of emphasizing in different ways, this connection. So there's, there's primrose tufts. So you have a whole grouping of these primroses in that green bower. Remember a bower is kind of like a protective shade uh, from trees, right? You could, you can lie under a bower and a bower is often for lovers or for people to be protected under. So through those primrose tufts in that green bower, the periwinkle trails its wreaths, and tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. So basically, you know, I think he, he's saying that when you have the yellow flowers of pleasure and joy around him, and it makes him believe that, um, you know, and, and again, believe, make a note of that, where he has faith here. So the, the faith part is, is what focus on the faith part here because he's bringing up somewhat religious reverential terms, right? So there, he has faith uh, that, you know, so this is creed. He talks about heaven at the, at the end of the stanza, at the end of the poem, that vegetation enjoys the air it breathes. And one hint to think about in unlocking this poem is do we as humans find joy in air that we breathe? I mean, do we find joy or is it just something we take for granted? He is saying that every flower enjoys the air it breathes, that it's, it's what it, a, a flower is. It's what vegetation does. And that's what it enjoys deeply. Now we're going to turn to animals. So the birds, the next stanza, the birds around me hopped and played their thoughts. I cannot measure but the least motion which they made, it seemed a thrill of pleasure. So the birds who caused uh, many of the sounds and the thousand blended notes, right, are creatures that he cannot comprehend their thoughts. They're animals. I mean, try and understand the, the, the thoughts of an animal. You can, we often tend to impose our own thoughts on animals, especially dogs. I see people do this all the time, assuming that a dog is making a certain face. It's like, no, dogs don't make faces, right? Like my dog, when she's panting, looks like she's smiling. And so people are like, oh, she's smiling. No, no, no. She's just tired. <laughs> she's just been running around and she's like, you know, panting to catch her breath. And, and dogs don't sweat. That's what they do when, instead of sweating as they, they pant. That's part of it, right? They're, they're catching their breath. They're hot. You know, she, that's, what, that's all that means. And she's not smiling at you. Now, that's not to say that she's not ha ever happy if she's also panting, but, you know, or happy, dog happy. But the point is that we, we, it's hard to, to measure an animal's thoughts, perhaps because they have no thoughts, unlike us. Maybe they're just pure sensation. But it appears that these birds find a thrill of pleasure to him in every one of their movements. So there's a, there's, he's making a relationship between sensation, pleasure, and contemplation. They're not able, he can't measure their thoughts. Maybe they don't think at all. Next stanza. The budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air. And I must think, do all I can 
that there was pleasure there. So we, we're back to vegetation, but now we're at a tree. The bud, now it's a budding tree. He's focused on the bloom, the, the, the coming into uh, life. So the budding tree spread out their fan. So you just imagine a, a tree with like uh, branches <laughs> that have leaves and they're, they're opening up and it's kind of like a fan and now they're, they're catching the air more to catch the breezy air. So it's almost like it's coming alive like a hand. He's making a relationship between a hand or a fan in this case, like a man-made object, but it looks like it, it's creating that sense. And the per, you know, it, he's saying that the purpose of the fan is to catch the breezy air. And I must think, so he's trying to think, I'm going to do all I can, but that there was pleasure there. And I'm going to assume that this thing who has no thought to it, you know, I, I think he's kind of stressing going into, again, uh, uh, we go from really plants or flowers to animals to trees, right? Trees probably have, in, in his mind, maybe the least amount of thoughtfulness or ability to think. They're more pure sensation or you know, just pure breathe in, breathe out and, and react to the world around it. If this belief from has, heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? I'm going to read again the last stanza. I think the, uh, the better one. I, I like the 1798 in most versions of everything I read. If I these thoughts may not prevent... If such be of my creed, the plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? So if I cannot prevent these thoughts, he says out loud, right? If I can't prevent these thoughts, if this belief from heaven be sent, that so there's a difference there. So if in that case, I think the meaning is something like, if this comes from heaven, whereas in the last stanza of the 1798 version, if I these thoughts may not prevent, so if I can't stop these thoughts from coming into my mind, if these beliefs be my creed, my plan, then I do not have reasons, then do I not have reasons to express passionately or lament what man has made of man? And, you know, so uh, I hope you see a little bit of a difference when he says, if this belief, so the belief of everything he's saying so far, so that, that uh, trees have pleasure when they touch the, the breeze, when they catch the breeze, that birds find a thrill of pleasure in every motion that they make, the, but the least motion, so no matter how small, there's a thrill of pleasure. There's pure sensation and joy and, and pleasure for them. The primrose, the, the, you know, enjoys the air it breathes. And then he's in this contemplative mood at the first two stanzas. So that whole thing is what he's saying is the thoughts he cannot stop. And if such be of my creed, the plan, so my creed, right? It's his religion. Have I not reason to lament, passionately cry out what man is made of man? And then, of course, in the, the 1802 version, if this belief from heaven be sent. So the, the, again, when it's be sent, it's almost like, a God sent it down. So there, there's, a, there's a big difference in his, there's a big shift here, right? If this belief be from heaven be sent, so, you know, Mercury comes down and sends this message to him versus he comes up with it through looking out at nature. This is why I think I prefer, prefer a lot of his earlier stuff. And I think a lot of people do. Um, and he, he whiffles on this throughout his life, this view that he is capable of creating a religion. And I think it's, you know, a lofty thing, but to try to create a religion. So that, that I think is a, the, the essence of what he's saying. And then the question is, what does he mean by what man has made of man? Now, I think one of the things that makes this a great poem is that it is somewhat, you know, it's specific in what it's trying to express this feeling of, you know, lamenting what is man made of man. We can kind of sympathize with that. Like, in every era, we always, you know, when you go back in history and you read the thoughts of great thinkers, there's always this idea that, you know, what have we done to each other? I mean, look at these wars, right? Why are we in the crusades? What has man done to man? Why do we, you know, have these slaves? Let's release these slaves. And they fight a civil war in 1860, right? What is man made? What, ha, what man is made of man? Why do we put men in these kinds of servitude situations? And why aren't we treating them correctly 
you know, after the civil war in the South, like what, what's going on? What is, what man has made of man? And I think you can kind of feel that in every era. And so there's something where this is kind of a, a pain on as a, 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 a word that, uh, you know, a feeling that we can experience in every era from all of history, from the past into the future. I think that's one of the things that makes it great is that it doesn't exactly tell you what man has made of man, right? Like you make something, what have we done to man? What you can kind of fill in the blank, but he's giving you the feeling of what that's like of, of making that kind of mistake. You're in this sweet mood of contemplation. You're thinking about the relationship between real, you know, uh, reality and thoughtfulness. And he's in that mood. He's thinking about something and he looks around and he says, wait, nature doesn't do these things to each other. You don't see, you know, nature just enjoys pleasure. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't, of course, uh, which people mentioned today about environmentalists, rightfully so. He doesn't mention a lot of the brutality of the wild nature, but at least not in this poem, but he makes a good point that you don't see uh, enslavement, for instance. You don't see torture for the sake of torture. At least he does it. Um, although there are supposedly some monkeys who have, you know, done some really atrocious things. But for the most part, you don't see that kind of thing. You usually see just, you know, nature doing its thing. Maybe there's some killing going on, uh, which there is, of course, a lot of that, the food chain. But the point is that he's making is that you don't see like, you know, making uh, poor people suffer intensely until they die. Right? You don't see that going on here in nature. You know, there's survival of the fittest, sure, but you don't see that kind of evilness, uh, you know, the evil that he would think of as evil is, is in his mind, allowing, you know, doing nothing about someone who's poor, for instance. So there are, there are things that are unique to what man does to man and what he's made of man that unique, that's not natural. So man in a natural state is not like that. He's saying, which again is a, is a belief I don't really agree with. I think life is pretty crappy without that. But, but again, this is in 1798. This is, you know, right during the beginnings of the industrial revolution. So you're not really, you know, he's not able to see the quality of what the industrial revolution brings to life at this point. It's all he sees are the, the darkened clouds, you know, men enslaving away at twisting a little knob until they're dead. Right. And they're not getting paid any money. It's their bet. And, and there's some truth to what he's saying. You know, the transitionary period into the industrial revolution isn't a pretty sight for a lot of people. It's not that pleasurable for most people. And he thinks that it can be pleasurable for people to live and it should be. And you can sympathize with him, right? Like I think life is way better with the industrial revolution, but in the time there were people who suffered. And, you know, when you don't know a lot about history necessarily, the specifics, you don't have the data on how much people suffered before, you know, you, or, or at least th how, that they suffer more before than after the industrial revolution. You don't know that yet. You know, I, I can sympathize with where he's coming from here. Now, I want to read the Robert Burns poem that is when you get um, man was made, what man has made of man is a, a, a play on the Robert Burns poem, man was made to mourn. Now, here we have a much more specific, concrete view of what it is that Wordsworth didn't have the specificity of what he means by man is made to mourn. He allows you to interpret that in your own way. So you can use that, the lines poem by Wordsworth on any, you know, political or cultural movement that you want. I mean, communists could have made, used it if they wanted to. And so could capitalists, we could, you know, capitalists could say like, look, we don't want babies to die in a uh, third world country. So we want them to have access to fossil fuels. Like, look what man is made of man. We're stopping these kids from having a, you know, easy, reliable, cheap, affordable uh, energy. And so their uh, incubators are going out because it's on solar panels, which go out, you know, when the sun, a cloud goes over it and then they're dead. Right. So we need to stop this. This is horrible. What is man made of man? That's horrible. I mean, you could use that as a capitalist slogan up against all the ambitious poor that aren't able to rise up because of, you know, the equality or because we want to have minimum wage laws, which markets them out or the market. So they can't get a job and ambitious poor people can't work for free and then work their way up like everybody else does, you know, and that's, that's what you, you so you could use. What is man made of man? You can use it for that. You could use it for environmentalists, right? It's like, well, look, we're destroying nature for man. And what is man made of man? Or and they'd probably say, what is man made of, you know, real or nature, but communists could use it. Like, look at what is man made of man? Look at the poor proletariat 
uh, the bourgeois have done to the proletariat? What is man made to, of man? So you could you could use it for all those things, and I think that's part of what makes it a great universal poem is that it, it's it's saying something very broad that can be used in different ways um, because it isn't necessarily specific. Now Robert Burns is more specific. So we're going to re read through this. I'm going to try and go a little faster. I'm not going to go into as much detail here, um, but I hope you get a sense for this. And I think when you hear his, you know, words about uh, forests and, and things of that nature, you, you'll see some of his view of, or why he's considered a pre-romantic. Okay. Man was made to mourn by Robert Burns. When chill November's surly blast made fields and forests bare. One evening, as I wandered forth along the banks of air, I spied a man whose aged step seemed weary, worn with care. His face furrowed o'er with years, and hoary was his hair. Young stranger, whither wanderest thou? began the reverend sage. Does thirst of wealth thy step constrain, or youthful pleasures rage, or haply pressed with cares and woes, too soon thou hast began to wander forth with me to mourn the miseries of man. The sun that overhangs yon moors, outspreading far and wide, where hundreds labor to support a haughty lordling's pride. I've seen yon weary winter sun twice forty times return, and every time has added proofs that man was made to mourn. O oh man, while in thy early years, how prodigal of time, miss spending all thy precious hours, thy glorious youthful prime. Alternate follies take the sway, licentious passions burn, which tenfold forces give nature's law, that man was made to mourn. Look not alone on youthful prime, or manhood's active might. Man then is useful to his kind, supported in his right. But see him on the edge of life, with cares and sorrows worn. Then age and want, oh, ill-matched pair, show man was made to mourn. A few seem favorites of fate, in pleasure's lap caressed. Yet think not all the rich and great are likewise truly blessed. But oh, what crowds in every land, all wretched and forlorn. Through weary life, this lesson learn, that man was made to mourn. Many and sharp the num numerous ills, and woven with our frame. More pointed still we make ourselves, regret, remorse, and shame. And man, whose heaven-erected face, the smile of love adorn. Man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands more. See yonder poor or labored white, so abject, mean, and vile, who begs a brother of the earth to give him leave to toil. And see his lordly fellow warm, the poor petition spurn. Unmindful, though, a weeping wife and helpless offspring mourn. If I'm designed yon lordling's slave, by nature's law designed, why was an independent wish e'er planted in my mind? If not, why am I subject to his cruelty or scorn? Or why has man the will and power to make his fellow mourn? Yet let not this too much, my son, Disturb thy youthful breast. This partial view of humankind is surely not the last. The poor, oppressed, honest man had never, sure, been born, had there not been some recompense to comfort those that mourn. O oh, death, the poor man's dearest friend, the kindest and the best. Welcome the hour my aged limbs are laid with thee at rest. The great, the wealthy, fear thy blow from pomp and pleasure torn. But oh, a blessed relief for those 
that weary laden morn. Okay, let's go through this quickly and uh, and wrap up. So he's giving you why man was made to mourn. What's going on? The way Burns sets this up is when chill November surly blast made fields and forests bare. So he's painting a picture of winter, right? He could say if he was a boring sap hack, he would say it's when in winter. <laughs> One evening I met this guy, an old dude, and he seemed kind of tired. And he had white hair, right? That's how a boring crack hack would, would write that. A great poet writes when chill November's surly blast, right? He's giving you a concrete image. Chill November's surly blast, right? Like a, like a surly old man made fields and forests bare, right? Because it's all the green is gone. One evening, as I wandered forth along the banks of air, uh, it's, I assume it's a river or a lake of some sort. I don't know anything about air, A-Y-R. I spied a man whose aged step seemed weary, worn with care. Right, So he's describing what the man is like. He's worn with care. He seems weary. He has an aged step. So you can have a picture of this old guy creaking along. His face furrowed over with years and hoary. That's white, white wispy, like uh, cobwebs are hoary was his hair. He had hoary hair. Now, this is in quotes. I hope that came across in my reading, um, but it's important if you're listening only that this is in quotes, and most of the poem is in quotes from the old man. And he says, he starts off, Young stranger, whither wanderest thou? Where do you go? Where are you going? Well, whither, where wander you? Where do you wander? And then it's, uh, end quotes there, beyond, began the reverend sage, right? So we always associate sageness and, and intelligence or wisdom, at least, not intelligence, wisdom with age, which we could talk about more on other podcasts, how Hawthorne didn't agree with that necessarily. But anyway, began the reverend sage, begin quotes again. Does thirst of we wealth thy step constrain? So constrain means force, compel forward. So are you you compel are you moving right now? Are you uh, motivated by thirst of wealth or youthful pleasures rage? Right? Is that what's motivating you? Youthful pleasures rage? Or happily pressed with cares and woes, too soon thou hast began to wander forth with me to mourn the miseries of man. So are you uh are you out here in winter for getting, you know, because you're compelled to get wealth, to get some kind of pleasure, maybe to go have sex with somebody, right? Or are you happily, uh, are you at a certain place in your life for some, whatever reason, even though you're young and you're pressed with cares and you are pressed with woes, you, you have all these things that, and these things are happening to you too soon. You has begun to wander forth throughout the world with me, this old aged man who's worried and mourn, mournful, the mis and, and you're going to mourn with me, the miseries of man. Next stanza, still in quotes, continuing the quotes. The sun that overhangs yon moors, those moors over there, outspreading far and wide, where hundreds labor to support a haughty lordling's pride. Right, so in England, a lot of, um, you know, the lands would be owned by, you know, this is a fiefdom, for instance, let's say. So a fiefdom would be something like you have this, this whole land, and then all the people on that land are just working for that one dude. Right, or you could you could take this as in later periods after um, the the this type of uh, system is you could say well maybe all these workers are working on a castle for this lordling right and they're they're hundreds labor to support a lord, haughty lordling's pride but I think it's more fiefdom he's talking about I've seen yon weary winter sun twice forty times return and what do you think that means I've seen yawn that weary winter sun twice 40 times return so how many times has he seen the winter sun how many in other words how many winters has he seen 40 or twice 40 now i, I just asked that you know to give you a, a when you're reading romantic poetry especially and great poetry they never just say the thing or they rarely ever say the thing they're always coming up with unique imaginative ways of, ima of imagining 
the thing that we're talking about. So instead of saying I'm 80 years old, he says, I've seen that winter sun that we're looking at twice, 40 times. And it also adds to the theme that he's kind of building up in this poem. And every time I've seen that, every time has added proof that man was made to mourn. So he has a lot of evidence, 80 years of evidence that man was made to mourn. Next stanza, continuing the quote, O oh man, while in thy early years, how prodigal of time, wasteful of time. You were, you know, we all know this. Youth is wasted on the young, right? I'm only 34, but I, I look at these 24-year-olds and I'm like, man, youth really is wasted on the young. <laughs> and I, I wonder how I'm going to feel when I'm 50. Ooh. No, not, not, nothing wrong with being 50, by the way, I'm just saying. <laughs> and it, continuing, miss spending all thy precious hours, thy glorious youthful prime. Alternate follies take the sway. Licentious passion burns, which tenfold force gives nature's law. That man was made to mourn. Right? So he's saying that people basically in their youth are just, they waste their time on different follies that take, the, whatever takes their passion, you know, licentious passion, usually uh, something along the lines of sex or, or wealth, like he said earlier. And like nature's law, this kind of uh, force gives nature's law that man was made to mourn. Look not alone on youthful prime or manhood's active might. Man then is useful to his kind, supported in his right. But see him on the edge of life, with cares and sorrows worn. Then age and want, oh, ill-matched pair, show man was made to mourn. So he's saying, you know, look not alone on youthful prime. Don't just look at youthful prime. This also happens. And don't look just at manhood active might, right? In his prime of manhood, you know, 30s, 40s, maybe in 50s a little bit, depending on the man. Man then is useful to his kind. He, he can be useful to his kind. If you look at the totality of man, he's capable of doing stuff for other men. But when you see him on the edge of life with cares and sorrows worn, like the old man himself was speaking in this, with age and with want, which are an, an ill-matched pair. It's not a good pair to have want, to want food, for instance, and clothing, and a roof over your head, and love, maybe, and to be old, right? That's not a good thing. But this shows you that man was made to mourn. That's what he was made to mourn. Well, who made him mourn? Looks like other men are doing that. A few seem favorites of light fate, and pleasure's lap caressed. That's a Great metaphor, pleasure, pleasure's lap. So it's, you know, you're, you're imagining a beautiful woman or a beautiful man who's in, you know, who these rich people, these few favorites of fate, are able to sit in the lap of luxury. Right? That's another, I wonder if, I don't know if this maybe came from this quote here or something like that. I wouldn't be surprised. Pleasure's lap caressed. So they're caressed by pleasure. Yet think not all the rich and great are likewise truly blessed. They're not actually blessed. But oh, what crowds in every land, all wretched and forlorn, through weary life this lesson learn that man was made to mourn. Even they're going to eventually learn that man is made to mourn. Next stanza. Many and sharp the numerous ills inwoven within with our frame. We're built for ills, this old man is telling you. You know, that's all we have. Is we, you know, not all we have, but that's part of who we are. More pointed still, we make ourselves regret, remorse, and shame. And we do it to ourselves, right? More pointed still, we make ourselves mourn. Why do we do it? Because of the regrets of what we don't do in life, the remorse for what we did do in life, and the shame for what we, you know, the pain that we caused other people. And man, whose heaven-erected face, the smile of love adorn. Here's, here's an important quote. Man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. That you might have heard that before, man's inhumanity to man. That is definitely the place where this, that was a, that's a very famous quote, and it definitely comes from Robert Burns. Next stanza. See yonder, see that poor person? See yonder poor, over-labored, white, so abject, mean, and vile? See that, that you know, the, the person that we are disgusted by, because he's mean, he's vile, he looks average or under-average, he's abject, ugh who begs a brother of the earth to give him leave to toil and see his lordly fellow worm. So again, he's drawing a picture of a ugly beggar and a Lord, but he's calling the Lord a 
fellow worm. So they're both equal worms. You know, they're both just, uh, that's, that's a, a way to, you know, euphemism for humans. Like instead of the, the godliness of man, he's ta- calling them worms, right? And they're just worms dressed up in different attire. One is a lord and one is a beggar. The poor petition spurn. So he, he spurns the guy's petition, the beggar. So the Lord says, be gone with you, to the beggar. And the Lord is unmindful, though, of a weeping wife and helpless offspring mourn. So he's causing more mourning by not giving alms. That's what that is essentially saying. If I'm designed, yon lordling slave, by nature's law designed, why was an independent wish ever planted in my mind? Now, that's a very interesting question. If I'm designed to be that yon lordling slave by nature's law designed, you know, by nature's law, well, then why did nature put an independent wish ever plant, planted in my mind? And there's always good questions like that, you know, when it comes to God. So if God doesn't want us to have a lot of sex, then why did he make us want to have a lot of sex? Like, what kind of weird thing is that? Uh, if not, why am I subject to his cruelty or scorn? Or why has man the will and power to make his fellow mourn? Why do we have that ability to make each other mourn? Why is that even in the world? This is a question about the problem of evil. Why is that even allowed? Why are we allowed to have poor people who suffer? Like, wh- why, is that the, why is that you know, uh, in the system? Yet, let not this too much, my son, disturb thy youthful breast. Don't, don't worry about it too much. You're still young. This partial view of humankind is surely not the last. So it's not the last or only view of of mankind, of humankind. The poor, oppressed, honest man had never sure been born, had there not been some recompense to comfort those that mourn. So there is a recompense. What's the recompense? Oh, death. Yay! (laughs) Oh, death, the poor man's dearest friend, the kindest and the best. Welcome the hour my aged limbs are laid with thee at rest. The great, the wealthy, fear thy blow, your your blow of death. From pomp and pleasure torn from all their, their pride and their pleasures. But oh, a blessed relief for those that weary laden mourn. But death is a good thing to those who are weary. So this is a poem that's saying that what's man, man is making man uh, mourn by his actions or by his inactions. And so this is kind of the inspiration for what Wordsworth is writing in lines written in early spring. Of course, he does, I think, a grander job of it. He does it more about contemplation when uh, Burns is doing it. He's he's doing it in the voice of a old man talking and kind of preaching, a poor beggar old man who's preaching to a young man and telling him how to be better and how to, you know, um, how to look, how, just kind of giving him a little bit of wisdom. And I'll just end with this because I want to end before the, um, I, I ran a little bit longer than I wanted to, but end before the hour. Thank you for sticking around. But when we talk about, when we think about where ideas come from, they off, they obviously come from great philosophers, but they're spread through great poetry and art. And this is an idea that lasts to today. I mean, this idea that goes back before these guys, but there, there is something where, you know, Wordsworth is picking up on, well, we owe something to mankind. We need to build something. And he's saying that it's, it's done through a love of nature and a protection of nature. And um, Burns is saying something more of along the lines of just giving it, giving alms is our duty. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed those two poems and I'll see you next time.